So this video is a quick crash course in several different IR missions, primarily Wise, Spitzer, and Herschel. So just the basics of infrared missions. Why do I need to go to space? Well, the infrared light doesn't make it down to the ground. Here I have a cartoon of transmission as a function of wavelength here. And so if you're a gamma ray astronomer, an X-ray astronomer, or a UV astronomer, you have no choice. You have to go to space because those wavelengths really don't make it down to the ground at all. If you're an optical astronomer, of course, you can observe from the ground. If you're observing in the near infrared, well, it's really tough because you get all these windows, these small windows. All these absorption bands are caused by uh, water, carbon dioxide, oxygen, molecular absorption bands from our atmosphere, which, you know, I for one am really glad that we have lots of oxygen down on the ground, but it makes it really hard to do infrared astronomy from the ground. If you pick your window very carefully and you go to a very high, very dry mountain, then yes, you can observe from those windows. But longer wavelengths, really, you have no choice. You have to go to space. And by the time you make it to the radio, those do make it. That way, light does make it down to the ground. Uh, submillimeter is kind of in between IR and radio. So the main reason we need to go to space for infrared astronomy is that the atmosphere absorbs the IR light. We, we have no choice. But the other big reason is that space is cold. If you're observing little tiny bits of heat, then your telescope needs to be as cold as you can get it. And there's really nothing colder than space. So we have lots of space-based data. We've got data from Spitzer, Wise, and Herschel. We also have ground-based data. SCUBA, which like I said is, you know, submillimeter is basically almost radio. We've got near infrared from two mass, and they did pick those bands very carefully. And then of course we've got optical data from the ground too. So it turns out that throughout human history we've had a small fleet of infrared telescopes. These are just the major ones. They also happen to be the ones for which we have data housed at URSA. We're going to focus specifically on Spitzer, Wise, and Herschel. So the launch sites for these three spacecraft are very different. WISE and for that matter IRAS both launched from a military base outside of Los Angeles. Spitzer launched from Cape Canaveral in Florida. Herschel launched from French Guiana. So even if I didn't tell you anything else about these spacecraft, you probably can guess that WISE and IRAS had similar orbits. Spitzer has a different orbit than WISE and IRAS. Herschel probably has a different orbit still. So here is the WISE launch. WISE is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. It's entirely funded by NASA. It was launched from Vandenberg in December 2009. That's its logo. So their or the orbit that both IRAS and WISE have um, paints the whole sky. So on the first orbit, they take a series of pictures, and then the next orbit is a little bit offset, and they take more pictures. And after many orbits, they cover the whole sky. So each one of these orbits then covers more and more and more of the sky. That representation there is meant to be the Earth. And so as these spacecraft orbit, they're of course looking out, and they paint the whole sky. So every orbit, every 90 minutes, they're observing things at the poles. But the stuff on the ecliptic plane, the stuff on the equator, gets hit several successive orbits, but basically twice a year for about, for, you know, for, for about 40 days. So you've got the, you know, less coverage in the ecliptic plane and then coverage from every orbit on the poles. So if I wait just a little bit longer, the movie will wrap around and it will start more from the beginning. And... There we go. So that's the first orbit, and the next one is a little bit offset. And then every successive orbit continues to paint out the whole sky. So when you have this kind of an orbit, this is well inside the moon's orbit. And so paying it, you know, the, these spacecraft need to pay attention to where the moon is, because you don't want to look at the moon because you'll blind yourself. So um, they have to be careful about you know, tweaking some of these observing passes so they don't look at the moon. Of course, they're looking out. They're not looking at the Earth. So that is le somewhat less of a concern. These orbits are also below much of the Earth's radiation belts. And so the spacecraft take radiation hits. Um, for you orbit aficionados, this is called a sun synchronous polar orbit because what happens is these spacecraft are orbiting at the day-night terminator. 
weather satellites do this often too because they're looking down trying to paint the whole earth um, so it, they, they always live in twilight and as the earth rotates this the terminator of course moves and these orbits are moving at the same rate so it's sun synchronous and it's a polar orbit because it goes through the poles on each orbit this is what the Y spacecraft looks like it has the the business end the telescope itself that's in there is made out of aluminum and it was cooled to less than 12 Kelvin via solid hydrogen that it carried on board. Um, the star trackers, which are basically small telescopes that have big fields of view so that the spacecraft knows where it's pointing. There's antennas down there. Uh, note that the spacecraft, you know, the telescope part is separate from the electronics part by these struts because they're trying to carefully manage thermal control, trying to make sure they keep the telescope as cold as they can. And then the solar panels are out there. This is just another view, a cutaway view of what it looks like inside um, where the, the solid hydrogen was in a basically like a cylinder in the cryostat there. And then all of the, the focal planes and what have you are in there. This is Spitzer's launch. So this is really what it looked like. Spitzer launched in the middle of the night and it was uh, from Cape Canaveral in Florida. And it turns out that the Cape Canaveral is actually a big complex and the best place to watch the manned launches are totally different than the best places to watch the unmanned launches. Um, so it turns out that for the launch pad that Spitzer was on, the best place to watch it was actually a fishing pier in a park just south of Canaveral. So this is really what it looked like. It was in the middle of the night with a handful of really annoyed fishermen and a whole fleet of really excited astronomers screaming, go baby go. So this, I mean, this, when the spacecraft was launched warm, so it was launched with the same temperature that it had in the middle of an August night. Here, just because I have it, is Spitzer's launch in the infrared, of course, because of course we have it in the infrared. This is a building that was uh, in between the camera here and the launch pad, which is about here. It's gonna take a little while. This is a cloud bank. There we go, there's ignition. So you see the plumes and then there's this, the, the rocket going up. And what's really cool, watch for reflections off the cloud bank. There we go, as it goes through the cloud bank and up into orbit, because it's just cool to watch the launches in infrared. You can watch the heat plume dissipate down here. So um, Spitzer is in a much different orbit than uh, WISE or for that matter, IRAS. So this screenshot is from an application called Eyes on NASA. It's really, really cool. If you haven't discovered this, you should go try it because you can you know, do all sorts of really cool things in this app. They have um, labels here that are basically illegible uh, if you were in a lecture hall, but so I'm gonna make them bigger. So sun is there, the earth is there, there's Mercury and Venus, and then there's some other spacecraft flying around. There's Mars out there. There's stereo behind and stereo ahead. Stereo is a mission that studies the sun. Osiris Rex is there, it's on its way to Mars. You can see this is what it looked like you know, this morning as I'm recording this. There's Spitzer right there. So Spitzer is in an Earth trailing solar orbit. So what that means is we gave it enough energy on launch to kick it out of the Earth moon system and it has just slowly trailed away from us ever since. It's got a little bit less energy than the Earth does and so it's just slowly with respect to Earth falling away from us but it is continuing to orbit the Sun. But look at the distances here. This right here is a circle that is the distance between, that the diameter of this is the dis distance between the Earth and the Sun. But look, Spitzer is farther away from Earth than the Sun is. So it's, it's a long haul now. It takes a very long time for light to travel between Earth and Spitzer and back again. But the main advantage of this orbit is that it, in terms of infrared astronomy, is that it gets us away from the Earth-Moon system. The Earth-Moon system is actually very, very warm. So if you want to observe things in infrared, you need to help make your telescope as cold as possible. And by getting away from the Earth-Moon system, that helps a lot. By getting away from the radiation belts, we actually mean, it actually means that the spacecraft suffers less punishment from the charged particles that orbit in the Earth's radiation belt. Okay, so what does space, the spacecraft look like for Spitzer? Um, this was the original design in 1990. This was actually a lot like the IRAS design where the telescope itself is entirely within um, the liquid cryogen. 
But the new design from 2003 uh, was that the telescope is outside of the cryogen bath and the telescope is cooled by having the cryogen exhaust out past the telescope. It was really, really clever engineering because you have then a much smaller uh, spacecraft, you have so it's less mass that you have to launch. It's easier to test because you don't have to cool down the whole telescope. It just saved a lot of money. So this is what it actually looks like. Telescope is there. The instruments live there. The cryogen live there, and then there's all the electronics down there. You can see here too. It's only connected to the telescope by struts, and it's got the solar panels that help protect the entire assembly from the sun. The side of the telescope that is. Uh, Away from, the destroyed the sun is silver and the side that is away from the sun is black so it can passively radiate. When we had liquid helium on board, the cryogen in here, and then the telescope which is made entirely out of beryllium was cooled down to less than 6 Kelvin. But now that there's no more helium, it has to passively cool and it does so pretty well. It's, it's not very warm, but it's still too warm for uh, the the, most of the instruments, most of the channels on Spitzer. The shortest two channels of Spitzer, like the shortest two channels of Wise, are about three and a half and four and a half microns. And those are still working uh, because the passive cooling of the spacecraft is still possible. Herschel's launch looked like this. It is This one is mostly European funding, whereas WISE and Spitzer are all US funding. Herschel is mostly European funding. It was launched from French Guiana in May 2009, and there's actually two spacecraft inside that fairing. There's Herschel and Planck that were launched together. Planck studies uh, basically the beginning of the universe, the very, very long wavelengths. Herschel is long wavelengths, but not as long as Planck is. Herschel's orbit is much different than the other two orbits. Uh, so it turns out that if you actually do the three-dimensional calculations of gravity fields, when you have the Earth going around the Sun or any body uh, orbiting the Sun, you have these quasi-stable or very stable points. They're called Lagrange points. So in the case of the Sun and Jupiter, the Trojan asteroids orbit in Jupiter's L4 and L5 points. There are various science fiction books about people living in the Sun-Earth L4 and L5 points because those are pretty stable. L1 and L2 are semi-stable points. Um, and so Herschel and other spacecraft that live at the L2, Lagrange, you know, L2 point do basically Lissajou figures. So basically like kind of figure eights around that point. And so Herschel was in that orbit for the length of its mission, but it had to move after it ran out of cryogen to make room for other spacecraft like Webb that will end up at the L2 point. So the spacecraft for Herschel is much bigger than the others. Their telescope is made out of silicon carbide, which is like basically a ceramic, uh, and it is simply passively cooled to between 70 and 90 Kelvin. It did carry cryogen on board. It had liquid helium to cool the instruments down enough to observe at those wavelengths. And when the cryogen ran out, there's that's it. There's no more extended mission possible for Herschel. So this is just another view, cutaway view of the spacecraft. You can see that it's got a sunshade, the telescope, where the cryogen lives, and then the body, the, the business of the telescope, all the electronics and everything are down there. So you can see there's lots of similarities in design in these IR telescopes. So how big are these mirrors? Well, there's a two-scale representation of Y's, and there's me and Andrew. Andrew is much shorter here than he is now. This is a relatively old picture, but me and the Y's um, telescope mirror are about the same dimensions, and that's scaled to 40 centimeters. That's Spitzer at 85 centimeters. Here comes Herschel. Herschel is enormous with a three and a half meter mirror to be compared with Spitzer's 85 centimeter or Wise's 40 centimeter. And the reason this is important is because the resolution of these spacecraft are related not just to the wavelength of light that they're using, but also the diameter of the telescope. So when you have shorter wavelengths, you don't need a very big telescope. But when you have longer wavelengths, like you do with Herschel, you need a big telescope to get comparable resolution to what you had at the shorter wavelengths. So what range of wavelengths do we have? Well, here's a representation of an IR spectrum. Spitzer is going from about 3.5 to 160 microns. WISE is going from 3.5 to about 25 microns. Herschel is going from 70 microns to 500 microns. So, you know, wide range of wavelengths covered by these missions.
And of course, for the warm spits or warm wise missions, it's, just, it's much smaller, it's just three and a half and four and a half microns. So as, as I've mentioned several times, keeping your spacecraft cool for doing infrared astronomy is absolutely critical to the mission. So Spitzer was launched in 2003 and has had nominally a five and a half year life. We went even longer. Um, now for warm Spitzer was just the shortest two channels. WISE went from December 2009 to September 2010. Its full cryo mission lasted about 10 months. And because of funding issues, it was turn, you know, turned off, turned on again, and now it's operating as NEOWISE R, which is, is just the shortest two channels, three and a half and four and a half microns. Herschel was launched in July 2009 and operated through April 2013. Well, I guess it was launched, sorry, it was launched in May 2009, but it took a little while to get out to the Lagrange point. So it started its regular mission in July 2009 and uh, ran out of cryogen in April 2013. It nominally had a three and a half year life and there's no extended mission possible for Herschel. Once there's no cryogen, then you can't do any extended mission because the instruments needed to be much colder than they can be from passive cooling. So throughout all of these spacecraft, as well as other spacecraft that observe the Earth in infrared, we have learned a lot about how to design good infrared telescopes. And so there's lots and lots of really fascinating, really sophisticated engineering and thermodynamics that go into the spacecraft design. And that's honestly a whole separate course that you could take on the thermodynamics of these spacecraft because they're managing where the heat and the power and the sunlight go and how to get rid of that power efficiently and still, in, and still do the infrared astronomy. So just for comparison, this is HST's orbit. Hubble is in a low Earth orbit at an inclination that used to be reachable by the shuttle, so it's almost in the ecliptic plane. And so every 90 minutes, it's going in and out of daylight, it's orbiting well within the radiation belts, and it is, it is observing, it is orbiting very, very close to the Earth. So knowing what you know now about infrared spacecraft, does Hubble do a lot of infrared observing? I'll let you figure that out. So just for context, here is the most famous image that is downloaded from the Hubble website. This is called uh, the Pillars of Creation. It is the talons in the Eagle Nebula. And what's going on is you have a bright group of stars up here that are pushing around the gas and dust and there's baby stars that are uh, being formed in some of these pillars. This entire image is 1.2 arc minutes on a side. So Spitzer has much bigger fields of view, and so it can cover a lot of ground pretty quickly. A single Spitzer field of view is five arc minutes on a side, and so it can tile a pretty large re region pretty efficiently, much more efficiently than Hubble can. So there's that Hubble footprint, and there's the Spitzer observations of the larger complex. This image is 4.58, 24, and 70 microns in the CMYK planes. There's IRAS. IRAS was the first infrared survey. Its pixels were enormous. I swear to you, this is lined up. It is lined up. But the pixels for IRAS were enormous because it was the first all-sky infrared survey. And the image that's going into this here is 1225 and 100 microns. But, of course, Spitzer is doing a lot better. It's a lot smaller pixels. Now there's Herschel. That, too, is lined up. You can see the talons and you can see the context, but here for Spitzer, the longest wavelength in the red plane is 70 microns. Here, 70 microns is the shortest uh, wavelength. So it's the blue plane. This is 70, 160, and 250 microns. So there's a lot of point sources there, many, many fewer point sources here. You can see the nebulosity, but the nebulosity is really dominating the flux that we get in Herschel. So the dust that we're looking at here is between 10 and 40 Kelvin. So really, really cold dust. Now this is WISE. That started out at the same scale. When I did this and this, the, the, the Spitzer and WISE data, there's not a ton more data outside of the image that I've got cropped. But for WISE, the data don't really stop. The WISE data just keep going. So it is much lower spatial resolution, but there's a lot more sky covered. That's the trade-off. So the resolution really matters. Here is um, one of my favorite pictures to demonstrate this point. It was originally from a press release talking about uh, detection of galaxies. But I like this because it really shows you the resolution issues. So the, the galaxy at the center here is detected in Chandra, but at the center, 
here, there's nothing really that you can see. So the Hubble images don't detect the galaxy. But here, Spitzer can see it. And that was the whole purpose of this press release. That was the science that was, OK, Spitzer can see things that Hubble can't, right? But I like this image because, look, we've got lots of galaxy shapes. We've got spirals, ellipticals, ellipticals, spirals, all sorts of, of shapes to these galaxies. But to Spitzer, they're all blobs of about the same size. And that's what I mean by spatial resolution matters. Hubble has much better spatial resolution, but the trade-off is that a single Hubble image doesn't cover very much space, very much ground, very much area. Spitzer has bigger pixels, and it can cover more area more efficiently. WISE covers the whole sky, but the pixels are even bigger. The resolution is even worse for WISE. So the issues of resolution and how the telescope responds to light, you already have some intuition about this because you know, if I showed you this picture, that on this night high school football game, those are not gigantic fuzzy blobs with lines coming off of them and big purple wings coming off of them. You know that. You know that from your experience. And so until I called your attention to them, you might not even have noticed them. That is just, those things are artifacts. That is how the telescope, that's how, sorry, the camera and the detector in the camera responded to this lighting situation. And it is reacting to those very, very bright lights. There are also effects like that that you just have to get used to in astronomy. Uh, you, there's ways that the telescope and the detector respond to very, very bright lights. And so you have to get used to looking for those issues in addition to the resolution issues. Um, so one of the things you could do is pick your favorite object and compare your image of your favorite object with all of the all of these other wavelengths. And this kind of thing is what we did in the spring, where we were trying to pull together data from for the same sources from many different wavelengths. So thumbnails, the sort of ways to remember it, I think of Spitzer Iraq, the shortest two bands, having spatial resolutions comparable to two mass. The other optical data are going to, that we have are, are going to be higher resolution. WISE is going to be worse resolution than Spitzer, and Herschel's going to be worse than WISE. So this is just another example of that resolution. Here's the same chunk of sky, WISE 1, 2, 3, and 4. This is a source that we identified as being potentially a young star because it had colors in WISE that made it look like a young star. But when you go and look with JH and K and 2 mass, POS, and Sloan, you can see, nope, that's an elliptical galaxy. So we found star formation. We, didn't just, we just didn't find star formation here. We found star formation in that other galaxy. So important jargon and pr data products. So wise jargon. So the jargon in this field sort of comes, is an overlapping uh, sense of jargon from the optical community, which is moving into the infrared, and from the radio community, which is moving into the infrared. So WISE channel 1 is sometimes called WISE 1 or W1 is 3.4 microns. WISE channel 2, WISE 2, W2 is 4.6 microns. WISE channel 3 is 12 microns. WISE channel 4 is 22 microns. The all WISE release is for the most part what we're going to want to use. It's the most complete release. It's all the data that were available at that time of that delivery over the whole sky, all summed up in the photometry done for us. The all sky release was covered, you know, covered just the time that there was cryogen, so when all four bands were operating. Once in a while, the the photometry in all wise fails for any number of reasons, and sometimes you can retrieve those quote-unquote lost sources by going back to the all sky catalog. The wise products, they give you images as well as the, in, you know, the individual exposures as well as the summed up mosaics. Those images are not individually calibrated. There's calibration information that's in the FITS header. So if you want to do your own photometry, you have to go look up the stuff in the, in the FITS header, look up the documentation, learn how they calibrated it, and do your own math. They do make do the catalogs for us, so you don't have to go figure all that out. You can just use their catalogs. But you do need to pay attention to what the data quality flags are telling you. If the computer is telling you that it doesn't believe that detection, you should listen to it. Those catalogs are calibrated, so you don't need to worry about it. They come through in magnitudes. And sometimes sources that are not really there at WISE 3 and WISE 4 do appear in the catalog. And that's why looking at the images is really, really, really important. And it comes back to something you'll hear me say a lot. Just because the computer says it doesn't mean it's right. For Spitzer, it follows the same sort of pattern. IRAC has four channels, channel 1, 2, 3, and 4. IRAC 1, I1 is 3.6 microns. IRAC 2, I2 is 4.5 microns. IRAC 3, I3 is 5.8 microns. IRAC 4, I4 is 8 microns. Then there's MIPS. Spitzer MIPS channel 1 
is 24 microns, channel 2 is 70 microns, channel 3 is 160 microns. So even though there's um, 70 and 160 micron data from Spitzer, we're not going to be using those because we can get 70 and 160 from Herschel, and that's better resolution for at those bands, better sensitivity than we can get with MIPS. We are going to use the MIPS 24 one uh, images, though. Interestingly, MIPS 24 is often called MIPS 24, right? M24. It's relatively rarely called M1, but IRAC is, you know, tends to be I1, I2, I3, I4. You don't ever hear I8. I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why that is, but that's, you know, that's how it is. The Spitzer products, the images come to you already calibrated in units of mega Janskis per stair radian. In order to do photometry like you might on an optical image, you do have to do some manipulations to those images or your resultant photometry in order to get the right answer. Um, in the, as you've heard me say in other videos from the cryo era, the YSOVAR collaborators reprocessed the, the cryo data for us. There's also SEIP, which is Spitzer Enhanced Imaging Products. There is a catalog. Technically, it's a source list. It's done by the SSC, and it's not as deep as what we get from the YSOVAR processing. The Glimpse Project did a survey of the plane of the Milky Way. They started out relatively small, but they did eventually the whole plane. But by the end, they really they only had the first two channels of IRAC to do. We're going to be using one of the releases from the Glimpse 360 Project, specifically the complete but less reliable archive catalog. For Herschel, yet more different jargon. Herschel PAX uses B for blue and R for red and there's 70 and 160 microns for them for that instrument. Herschel Spire uses S for short, M for medium, and L for long for 250, 350, and 500. I am sorry, but that is what they use. PAX images are in Janskis per pixel. Spire images are in Janskis per beam. In both of those cases, we're going to have to do some funny stuff to the photometry that we are that we measure in order to get out sensible numbers. Again, I'm sorry, but this is what we got. So hopefully, this gives you the broad picture of how different these spacecrafts are, but also how similar they are, and how their observations and data are fundamentally different from each other, and in some ways, fundamentally the same. <laughs>